<laughs> Welcome to Biff's Mystery Theater. I have many tales to tell you. Ghost stories, murder stories, and tales that will make your bones chill. <laughs> Join me, won't you? Every Sunday night for theater of the mind, where you always have the best seat in the house. <laughs> Columbia's program, Suspense. Our distinguished stars tonight are two of the world's acknowledged masters of the art of suspense. They are Mr. Charles Lawton and Miss Elsa Lanchester. Mr. Lawton, who will soon be seen in the Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer picture, The Man from Down Under, is here to play a remarkable character created by England's noted thriller author, Agatha Christie. A mild-mannered character whose initials were ABC and about whom revolved a series of savage murders all neatly and alphabetically arranged. ABC was stamped upon all his belongings, those being his rightful initials. And ABC was stamped, too, upon the large railway timetable he always carried. But there was nothing so odd about that detail, since no traveler in the British Isles would dream of planning a journey without consulting this famous railway schedule, the ABC. And so, with the ABC murders by Agatha Christie, written for radio by Robert Tallman and William Spear, and with the performance of Charles Lawton, we again hope to keep you in... Suspense. When the time for closing bell rang in the public library, Alexander Bonaparte Cust started, picked up his battered briefcase with the almost faded initials ABC, closed the book he had been reading, and shuffled over to the librarian's desk. Um, it's a most interesting book, Librarian. I should like to come back sometime and read another chapter of it, if I may. Quite. Uh, yes, Mr. Clark. Can I help you, sir? No hurry. Uh, well, I'll be going along now. Thank you. A rum little chap, that. What do you think he was reading? Studies in epileptic somnambulism. Medical stuff, eh? Oh, I say, the little fellow left his briefcase. I'll catch him at the door. I say, sir, just a moment. You left something. Oh, dear, it's my briefcase. I'm terribly sorry. I seem to be getting more and more forgetful lately. Why, only the other day I left it on the counter in a tobacco shop. Lucky you have those initials. Not many people with the initials ABC sticks in your mind. What do you mean by that, sir? Well, after all, they're the first three letters of the alphabet. Practically the first thing we learn, you know, isn't it? Our ABC. Well, don't mention those letters to me. They brought bad luck to me in more ways than one. Really? How's that? <laughs> Well, I used to be a traveling salesman, and I used to carry one of those railway town tables in my pocket, the Threepenny kind, in which they list the towns and all the railroads alphabetically. Oh, of course. Printed right on the cover, isn't it? Hey. ABC. Yes, that's right. So, well, stockings was my line, sir. I did door-to-door -door selling. Whenever I finished one town, out would come that timetable, and I'd look up the next stop on my route. I got sick of the sight of that ABC railway guide, I can tell you, sir. It was like a symbol of failure to me. One dingy little town after another and all listed in that railway guide with ABC printed on the cover. My own initials staring out at me from every newsstand and every dirty little railroad station in the Midlands. Oh, come on. It couldn't have been as bad as all that. Matter of fact, I never noticed it till I began to get the headaches. Oh, you suffer from headaches? Yes. Hmm. Have you seen a doctor about it? Oh, no, no. I wouldn't want to see a doctor about it. I already know what brings them on. Well, if you'd rather not talk about oh, it. Oh, no, no. It isn't that at all, sir. It was just uh, such a long time ago. 
During the last war, in fact, uh, Chateau Thierry. Uh, Chateau Thierry, oh, I yeah. say, what a coincidence. I was in the thick of that myself. Where yes, is, uh, we hmm. must get together for a drink one day, to talk over old times. Franklin Clark is my name. Oh, I'm pleased to meet you, Mr. Clark. My name's Cust. Alexander Bonaparte Cust. Well, they must have expected great things of you, giving you a name like that. I'm afraid they did, Mr. Clark, yes. I'm very much afraid they did. Mr. Cast! Oh, Mr. Cast! Who is it? It's me, Mr. Cast. I brought you up a spot of tea. Oh, it's you, Miss Marbury. That was very thoughtful of you. Oh, nonsense. <laughs> you know, Mother dotes on you. Oh. You're her favourite lodger. In fact, why, Mr. Cast, you're packing your things. You're not leaving us, are you? Oh, no, I'm just taking a little trip over the bank holiday, you know. Now, now, don't try to deceive me, Mr. Cust. You're embarrassed about owing us, aren't you? No. You needn't be, Mr. Cust. Really, you needn't. Oh, you, you are a nice girl, Miss Marbury. You really are a nice girl. As a matter of fact, I'm not going just for the bank holiday. I've uh, something rather important, some oh. very important matters to take mm -hmm. care of. You know, it's very possible that my mother didn't have me christened Alexander Bonaparte. Cast for nothing. Oh, have you got a position, Mr. Cast? Well... What is it? Well... Oh, come, Mr. Cast. You can tell me, can't you? Well, Miss Lily, I can tell you this much. I shall be travelling quite a lot. In fact, oh. uh, where did I leave that ABC railroad guide? Oh, yes, here it is. Uh, first stop, Andover. Andover? That's not very far. No, no, no. But I must be getting on if I don't want to miss that train. Now, let me see. Have I got everything? There's my spectacles and my overcoat, my typewriter, my walking stick... Did I ever tell you the history of this walking no. stick, Miss Marbury? It's a Scottish piece, very old. It's oh. always used as antique. You know, they used to kill people with these back in the days of the old clan wars in Scotland. I wonder how many heads this one has bashed in. Oh, oh. Mr. Cast. Oh, please, what a terrible way to talk. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry, Miss Marbury. I am a little bit surprised at myself talking like that. It must be my new job. It's gone to my head a bit. That's it. It's gone to me head. Mm. Have you got an aspirin by any chance? I've got an awful... <laughs> What'll it be? A packet of cold flakes for me. Yes, sir. And the other gentleman? Three Havanas, the shilling cigars. Havanas? You gentlemen must be up from London. That's right. Is that your name on the window of this shop? <laughs> That's right, sir. Olivia Asher. Been in business right here in Andover and right here in St. Andrew's Place for 20 years. Hmm, all A's. Andover, St. Andrew's Place and Asher. Funny, ain't it? That never so much has crossed my mind before. Well, Mrs. Asher, we're from Scotland Yard. We have reason to believe there may be a homicidal maniac at large in Andover. <gasps> Good blonde. We don't want to frighten you, Mrs. Asher. For all we know, this may be just a practical joke. You see, we received an anonymous letter, typewritten, and signed ABC. ABC? This murderer, if there's anything in his story, is planning a series of murders. His mania seems to be centered on the alphabet. If he follows his plan through, his first murder will be committed in Andover, and the victim will be a person whose name begins with an A. <gasps> the Lord help me, sir. You don't think... We don't think anything. Scotland Yard has taken its precautions. Oh, a woman takes a terrible chance. There's probably nothing to be alarmed about, but it won't hurt to keep a sharp lookout. Who's next on your list, Mackenzie? Next is Arthur Atwood. All right. Let's be on our way, then. Good day, madam. Don't worry. Thank you, sir. And good day to you, sir. A murderer lunatic in Andover of all places. Yes, sir? What'll it be for you, sir? These? That'll be one and six, sir. I said that'll be... Oh, no, no, no! <laughs> Newspaper sensation. Homicidal maniac in Andover. Alphabet murderer destroyed next to Spetsfield. Latest on ABC. Oh, boy, let me have one of those. Oh, yes, and use a standard, sir. Both, here you are. Oh, thank you, sir. 6 30 newspaper sensation. Nasty business, eh, mister? Oh, yes, very, very. You never know with lunatics. They don't always look bomber, you know. Sometimes they look the same as you on me, eh? Yes, I suppose they do. Oh, it's a fact. Sometimes it's the war on them. Never been right since. Uh, yes, I expect you're right. You know, I don't hold with wars. I hope this will be the last. You don't hold with wars, eh? Well, young men, I don't hold with plague and sleeping sickness and famine and cancer, but they happen all the same. 
And murder happens all the same. They can't prevent them. I'm sorry, sir. I, I expect you had a rocky time of it in the last one, eh? Yes, yes. My, my poor head's never been the same since. I get terrible headaches. Oh? Well, I'm sorry about that, sir. But sometimes I hardly know what I'm doing. You don't say. I forget things. You know, for instance, I could have sworn I had an ABC railway guide in my pocket an hour ago. Do you know they found one of them ABC railway guides on the poor tobacconist lady that he murdered? Who? Oh. He, ABC, whoever he is. Maybe he don't know himself. Never stop to think of that. Maybe he's so bummy he don't remember. I wonder. Bexhill, Bexhill, did he say Bexhill? That's my train. Well, goodbye, young man. Goodbye. Okay. I don't think I'll have the ham. I had ham for breakfast. Oh, yes, I think I'll have the mutton pie. One well, mutton pie? Yes, sir. Uh, what's the matter with you? You're trembling, young woman. Is something wrong? Oh, sir, if you only knew. I have to walk home tonight, after they close up here. And there ain't hardly a light in Benson Terrace where I live. Benson, Benson Terrace in Bexhill? Yes, sir. You're afraid of the ABC murderer, aren't you? He follows the alphabet, don't he? That was the way he done in Andover. Hey. And does your name begin with a B? Barnard's my name. Mary Barnard. Oh, dear me, Miss Barnard. <laughs> well, I don't like to appear forward. Well, anyway, I'm old enough to be your father. Would it make you feel easier if I saw you home tonight? Oh, you <laughs> don't know, sir. You just don't know what it would mean. <laughs> well, what time do they close up here? Nine o'clock. All right, I'll wait outside for you. <laughs> At nine o'clock? All right. Waitress brutally murdered in Bexhill. ABC strikes again. ER says Scotland Yard receives third murder note. Alphabet murderer to strike again in Chester. Yes, sir. Third class single to Chester. <laughs> uh, give me a pint of half and half, please. Yes, sir. There you are, sir. You up from London, sir? Uh, yes, I, I I come directly from London. Ah, salesman? Stockings is my line. Oh, rough going these days, what with rationing, eh? Well, well, well. It isn't my old friend Alexander Bonaparte Cuss. I'm sorry, I'm afraid I don't remember. We that. met in the library, remember? Oh, in London. Yeah. Yes, had quite a talk. Yeah. Franklin Clark, remember? Yes, of course. You'll forgive me, Mr. Clark. My memory, it seems to be getting worse and worse. But you must there. have come under better times, Mr. Cuss. New oh. briefcase, I see. Nice, bright, new initials. Well, I got a job shortly, shortly after I saw you, Mr. Clark, from uh, Ballinger Limited. Stockings. It's my old line, you know. But to tell you the truth, I haven't been doing very well. Oh, those headaches again? Yes, the headaches. And the murders. The murders have upset me something terrible. Oh, well, you're shaking like a leaf, man. No. Hey, Jonathan. A brandy for Mr. Cust. Oh, he thank needs you, it. Sir. The trouble with you, Cust, is you're inclined to be morbid. I remember that book you were reading the day we met, stuff about epilepsy. Well, it might be epilepsy, mightn't it? What? Well, they discharged me from the army before the war ended. Uh, you see, I had a kind of a fit, you know. And Never uh, had anything like it again, have you? No, I didn't have a fit again, just the headaches. I forget what happens, hours at a time. Do you know, once I was sitting in a station waiting room and a newsboy came by and I bought a paper from and it was all about that first murder... In Andover. Yeah. It said the police had got another note, another typewritten note, Mr. Clark, and the murderer was going to strike next in Bexhill. And suddenly I realized I was in Bexhill. Yeah. And I'd been in Andover the day before when the first murder happened. Well, how did you happen to go from Andover to Bexhill? Well, that's the way I'm supposed to go on my route, selling the stockings. I'm supposed to take the towns alphabetically. Oh, well, then it's not so surprising you should have been in Bexhill after all, is it? Just a coincidence. Oh, well, I, the waitress in Bexhill there, I... I walked home with her that night, Mr. Clark, the night she was murdered. Well, good heavens, Cusk, you don't think you killed Mary Barnard, do you? I don't know, Mr. Clark. It said in that book that people who have had epileptic fits often do things and don't remember them. 
They even commit crimes. I said good night to her, and after that, I well, don't now, know look, what happened. The notes, those typewritten notes. Wouldn't you have remembered if you'd written them? I don't know. Well, now, I know a little something about psychology myself, Gust. And I'd stake everything I own on the fact that the man who wrote those notes was conscious of what he was doing. Do you really think so, Mr. Clark? Positive of it. Now, pull yourself together, man. Incidentally, my sister-in-law lives here in Cheston. My brother is Lord Cameron Clark, and I oh. happen to know she needs some new stockings. Oh. Pop over there in the morning, will you, and show the old girl your line? Oh. Here, here's the address. Might cheer you up to make a, a good sale. Oh, I'm huh? sure it would, Mr. Clark. I'm sure it would. Well, good night, Mr. Clark, and thank you again for all your kindness. Good I'm night. sure, sir. Good night. Oh, wait a minute. You've forgotten something again. Oh, dear me, that's my typewriter. I shall certainly need that. Oh? Oh, well, it's to type up my report to the Home Office in case I should make that sale tomorrow. Oh, of course. Oh, yes, yes. By the way, Cust, better watch out. Somebody in Cheston is going to be murdered tomorrow. Aye. Old ABC is up to the letter C, you know, and your name is Cuss. Huh? Oh, I see. Good heavens. Mine is Clark. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, thank you again for your generous order, Lady Clark. I hope you'll be pleased. Uh, this uh, line of woolen line of stockings is uh, one of Ballinger's best buys right now, Lady Clark. My brother-in-law told me that you'd had some unfortunate times lately, Mr. Cuss. Yes. But I really did need the stockings, and I should... Hello again, Cuss. Hello, Hello sir. I'll be stuffing myself with bacon and eggs. Make a sale, old boy? Oh, yes, Mr. Clark. Thank you very good, much. Good, good. Louise is filthy with money, and her ladyship's legs are in constant need of recovering. Oh, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> yes, really. She, she wanted the stockings. Well, uh, thank you very much, my lady. I hope I shall have the privilege of serving you again next year. Goodbye, Mr. Cust, and good luck. Cheerio, Cust. Such a nice little man, Franklin. He's a bit off his nut, I'm afraid. Last night, he tried to convince me that he was the ABC murderer. His initials, you know. He has minor lapses of memory. That little man, a murderer? Oh, really, Frank? <coughs> Good Lord, what was that? <coughs> Who's the maid? Who is that girl? What's going on? In the master's bedroom, my lady. You better go with her, Mr. Franklin. Brothers, whatever are you doing here? Oh, my lady, the master, Lord Clark, has been murdered. Stabbed with a knife. Oh. All over blood. Murder? Oh. Good heavens. Why, look, look there on the floor. A railway guide, an ABC. Take me out of here, Franklin. Oh, and... Louise, I'm sorry you had to see this. Oh, Cameron. My poor Cameron. Who never made an enemy in his life. The man who did this was a maniac. And I'm afraid I know who he is. He always carried a walking stick with a heavy carved handle. That's how the other murders were committed, with a heavy stick. But he oh. wasn't carrying his stick today. Must have grabbed a knife up there somewhere to kill Cameron with. But when? Were you with him every minute? Well, I went upstairs to get my checkbook. It took me a little while to find it. That gave Cust his opening. Oh, to think that all that time. Oh, no. No, I'll never forgive myself, no, Franklin. No, none of that now, Louise. The important thing now is to stop him before he can commit another murder. But what are you going to do, Franklin? I'm going to the police and see if they'll let me help. Let's have a look at this ABC railway guide he left beside poor Cameron. Hmm. Look here. All checked. See there? Andover, Bexhill, Churston. Each with a check mark after it. No. Oh, where's the next one? Ah, see? See London. He's through with ABC, he's gone home, and I'm going after him. Yes? Well, Mr. Cust, come in. Whatever kept you away so long? Miss Lily, I've got to talk to you alone. Oh, well, I'll go up with you. I want to show you the new curtains I put up in your room oh, anyway. Oh, you are a nice girl, Miss Lily, really. Yeah, nice let girl. me carry one of these, Mr. Cust, the typewriter. No, 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 I'll carry my own thing, oh, thank oh, you. Oh, Mr. Cust, you're trembling. Oh, dear, you do look a fright. <laughs> look, I'm going to straighten get you a hot foot bath. No, no, not now, please, not now, Miss Lily. There's no time for it. What is it, Mr. Cust? Close the door and lock it. Are you in some trouble, Mr. Cust? I'm in terrible trouble, Miss Lily. I want you to hear the story first from me. You're the only one who has ever been my friend. Oh, I've had a lonely life, Miss Lily. Oh, poor Mr. Cust. Poor Mr. Cust. That's what they always say about me. Poor Mr. Cust. I thought you were different. Oh, don't take on so, Mr. Cust. It was only a manner oh, of speaking. Oh, you don't need to worry. I'm all right now. I never get two spells in one spells? day. Spells? Cust, I don't understand. What, what well, you, you heard of the ABC murders? Shocking affairs. 
But, Mr. Cust, why, why are Miss you Lily, saying the to... police will be here at any minute. Please let me finish. I don't want you to think harshly of me, Miss Lily. I didn't plan it ahead. My instructions told me where to go. Some people can't help what they do. There are diseases. Epilepsy, for instance. You do things you don't remember. You commit crimes. I'm like that. Oh, Mr. Cust, I can't believe it. When I was a child, Miss Lily, they used to badger me about my name. My mother worshipped strength. She named me after the strongest people she knew about in history. Alexander and Bonaparte. But nobody ever called me by those names. They called me ABC. ABC. Oh. I used to dream I was boiling in a kettle of alphabet soup. I was a terrible disappointment to my mother. Mr. Cust, you're unsettled and tired. You've got to hear me out, Miss Lily. Oh, you oh, got... my now, own listen to me, Miss Lily. I couldn't, have... I could have been a hero oh. once in the army in the last war. I was happy. I could have made something of myself. Then I started getting the Let headache. Me go, Mr. You Cust. must hear me out, Miss Lily. I started forgetting things after they discharged me from the army. Shop, they called it. I used to have dreams. Oh. I was a great ruler. The oh. destiny of men was in my hands. I had the power over them oh. of life. And death. Let me go. Oh, please let me go. First, there was Andover, that tobacconist. I can't even remember what she looked like. Then there was Bexhill. I walked home with a waitress from the station restaurant. She was murdered, too. In Cheston, I sold a dozen pair of stockings to a lady, and while she was upstairs getting her checkbook, her husband was murdered on the floor where I was waiting. And now I've come back here. Maybe the alphabet charm is over. Or is it? This is London. L. Your name is Lily. Are you trying to frighten me, Mr. Cust? I am trying to convince you. You, murderer? <laughs> I'd as soon believe it. Uh, my own mother. What about this? Look at it. Oh, no, no. Look closely at it. I found it in my briefcase when I came on the train, Miss Lily. This night murdered a man in Churston just three hours ago. No! 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 Now, there, there, Miss Marbury, don't take on so. He's all handcuffed pretty as you please in the next room. But he was such a nice man. I still can't hardly believe it. Is this the knife he threatened you with, Miss Marbury? <laughs> yes. We just got here in the nick of time, eh, Sam? Hey, that's a wicked-looking knife. It's the Churston murder knife, right enough, Mr. Clark. No doubt of it. Well, let's take inventory. Typewriter. Checks with the murder notes. Walking stick. Same markings as on the heads of the first victims. And the psychiatrist's report says the murders were premeditated and the notes could not possibly have been written except by a person who was conscious and in his right mind. Well, that breaks down any idea Cust may have had of entering an insanity plea. Right. I think he'll sign the confession without any difficulty. Bring him in. Bring the prisoner in. Well, Cust, are you ready to sign your confession? I don't know, Inspector. A moment ago I was certain I must have done it. But why? That's what worries me. Why? Mr. Clark, why do you think I did it? You're wasting valuable time, Cust. I don't care why you did it. You killed my brother and I want to see you hang for it. I don't care how balmy you are. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, talking to our Mr. Cust in that bloodthirsty manner. I don't know what's getting into the gentry, I'm sure. He tried to murder you, didn't he? Well, he couldn't help himself, poor thing. He's been terribly upset of late. You are a nice girl, Miss Lily. You are a nice girl. The, really. the murders were willful and premeditated. They couldn't have been premeditated, Mr. Clark. Why do you say that, Cust? Well, because I didn't go to any of those places of my own choice. I had my instructions from Bellinger's Limited. And those instructions were sent to me after the police got the warnings of the murders that were printed in the papers. There never were any such instructions. We ransacked all your things, Cust. There wasn't any letter of instructions, was there, Inspector? No. Oh, yes, there was. All right, we'll ring up Ballinger's. May I use your telephone, Miss Marbury? Oh, certainly, Inspector. The number is Regent 3313, Inspector. Oh. Oh. Ballinger's, are you there? Put me on to personnel. Oh, Mac, start packing those exhibits, will you? All oh, right, sir. Uh, Chrome speaking, Scotland Yard. But what day did you employ a commercial traveler named Alexander Bonaparte Cast? No, Cust. A.B. Cust. Initials A.B.C. Yes, yes. Never employed by you. You're absolutely certain? Did you send a man to Andover or Bex Hill last week? Not on your route. Thank you. That's all I wanted to know. Too bad, Cust. I guess this knocks out your last ghost of a chance, doesn't it? No, Mr. Clark. Because, you see, the instructions were in a letter, and that letter is right in this room. Well, let's have a look. Come on, Mackenzie, give me a hand. 
Let's go through these things again. It won't do you any good to look there, Mr. Clark. I have the letter. Would you like to see it, Mr. Crown? It's here. Well, I'll be... Where did you get that? It wasn't on him, Inspector. I'll swear to that. Where did you have this hidden? Uh, well, Inspector, it isn't generally known, but I do wear a small uh, hairpiece. Not out of vanity, mind you. I find it necessary for the business. Let's see that letter. Oh, gladly. Dear Mr. Cust, in close find advance, typewriter is being posted today. You will... Oh, what a lot of nonsense, Inspector. Look at the typeface of that letter. It's obviously written on Cust's typewriter. Yes, that's right, Mr. Clark. And the man uh, who he wrote took... that letter was the murderer. Cool as you like, he sent the typewriter to me and instructions on one of Ballinger's letterheads and the money and everything else. What kind of stunt are you trying to pull here, Cust? No stunt. It's just that when you made that telephone call, Inspector, and Ballinger said I'd never work for them, I knew that the typewriter must have been sent to me by the murderer. And the more I thought about it, the more it seemed to me that the murderer must be Mr. Clark. What? No, Why, this is too much of a fantastic, Inspector. Really, I... Well, I, the murderer would have to add to know something about me. Something I'd never confided to anyone but to Mr. Clark about my, well, my headaches. I'd been reading a book in the public library, Inspector, a book on epilepsy, and it seemed to me that what I suffered during the last war might have been epilepsy. And it was on my mind, see? It said that epileptics might commit crimes and not remember them under certain conditions. Without that to go on, the murderer couldn't possibly have pinned the crime on me. That works two ways, Cust. You might have told me that story deliberately, just so you could cook up this story now. Well, I couldn't cook up your fingerprints, Mr. Clark. And I'll wager anything. Your fingerprints are on that letter. Oh, come now, really. Well, that's easily settled. We can do it right here. Won't take a moment. Take a set of Mr. Clark's fingerprints, Mackenzie. You examine the prints in the letter meantime. Right, Inspector. Just press your fingers down firmly on this ink pad, Mr. Clark. What is it, Mr. Clark? It's quite simple, really. Yes, yes, it's so simple it isn't even necessary. I'm afraid this is necessary, Mr. Clark. Only a matter of routine, you know. But... I tell you it isn't necessary because Cust is right. I am the murderer. You? But wait, then... You killed your brother, Cameron Clark, so that you would inherit the estate? Yes, exactly. But the others, the A and B murders in Andover and Bexhill and... I committed them, all of them. Yes, but... Come now, gentlemen, surely you'll give me credit for thinking this thing through. If only my brother, Lord Clark, had been murdered, I, being the only heir, would have had a lot of explaining to do. So I invented my own little crime wave to make it appear as though he were just one of the victims of a homicidal maniac. And I must say, it almost came off, thanks to the, the unknowing cooperation of Mr. Cust here. Thank you just the same, Mr. Cust. You're very welcome. Oh, I mean... oh, oh Mr. Cust, I knew you couldn't be a murderer, not really. Oh, you are a nice girl, Miss Lily, really, you are About a nice girl. About those headaches, Mr. Cust, why don't you go to an oculist? Those headaches, maybe you just need a new pair of glasses. I think I'll do that, Miss Lily. Do you really think... Of course, yes. I'll wager that's what's been the trouble with me all along. You know, you glasses, need someone it? to take care of you. Oh, I do, Miss Lily, I do really... If only you... Oh, but no, you couldn't ever think... What, of... Mr. Cust? Well, I mean, Miss Lily, I was just thinking it would be really too much to ask anyone. Mrs. Alexander Bonaparte Cust. Not... But when we're married, please don't wear that toupee. It's very conspicuous. Oh, you are a nice girl, Miss Lily. <laughs> really, you are. I do hope... People won't call you Mrs. ABC. And so closes the ABC Murders, starring Charles Lawton with Elsa Lanchester and Bramwell Fletcher. Tonight's tale of... Suspense. This is your narrator, the man in black, who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next Tuesday when Agnes Moorhead will return to our stage a star of the suspense play called She Overheard Murder Speaking. The producer of these broadcasts is William Spear, who with Ted Bliss, the director, Lud Gluskin and Lucian Mahowick, conductor and composer... And Robert Tallman, the radio author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.
suspense. This is the man in black, here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. From Hollywood, we bring you a star, Mr. Orson Welles, who this evening begins a four-week engagement as guest of these proceedings. In the interest of prime suspense, Mr. Wells and the producer of this series have scheduled four radio stories which they feel are particularly distinguished in our chosen field. The first of these is The Most Dangerous Game by Richard Garnell. And so with the performance of Orson Welles in the character of General Zaroff and Keenan Wynn as Sanger Rainsford, who learned from Zaroff what was the most dangerous game... We again hope to keep you in suspense. I haven't much time. Any moment now he may come in, and when he does, I'm going to kill him. It's him or me, and I'm going to do my best to make it him. Well, maybe it sounds crazy to you. I guess it does. It would have sounded crazy to me a few days ago when I was with Whitney on the yacht. I was on a pleasure trip. <laughs> a pleasure trip? How, or I, how could I or anyone realize then the horror and torment I was to go through? How was I to know of Yvonne and the death swamp and the hounds? How was I to know of Zaroff? Think of it. It was only four nights ago that the ship went down... We'd been talking about this island, Ship Trap Island, Whitney said it was called on the charts. I was sleepy and started on down below to turn in. I was mixing myself a nightcap when I looked up and saw it. A tremendous reef racing at us out of the fog. I screamed out a warning, but it was too late. We were right upon it. safe out on the prowl, but the force of the explosion hurled me into the blood-warm waters. Terrified at the suddenness and surprise, my stomach weak and sick at the thought of the others. The sea was eddying furiously around the sinking remnants of the ship, and a certain cool-headedness came to me and made me swim desperately away, or I might not have lived to go through the horror which was soon to come. I struck out to the right in the direction of the island about which Whitney had been telling me. I had no recollection of how long I swam... But all at once I heard the muttering and growling of the sea breaking on the rocky shore. With my remaining strength, I dragged myself from the swirling waters. All in, gasping, my hands raw, I at last reached a flat place at the top. I flung myself down at the jungle edge and tumbled headlong into the deepest sleep of my life. When I awoke, I was in a strange place, having no idea how I had done Our friend seems to be awakening. I... Where, where is this? Where am I? Do not where be is... alarmed, my friend. My man Ivan found you out on the cliff. He brought you here to be taken care of. Oh, well, thank God there's life on this island. I hardly believed. Few people do. Yes, you are quite safe here in my castle, Mr... Uh, Rainsford. Yes. Rainsford. I'm Sanger Rainsford of New York. Rainsford? Sanger Rainsford? Yes. Well, it is indeed a very great pleasure and honor to welcome you, Mr. Sanger Rainsford. You are the celebrated hunter, are you not? Yes, yes. You know me? Uh, by reputation only. I've read your book about hunting snow leopards in Tibet, you see. My name is General Zaroff. I am not English, Mr. Rainsford, but I went to a good school. Perhaps you recognize the colors of my tie. Uh, no, it makes no difference. I've lived too long in the jungle to be a snob. <laughs> well, I... Uh, well, I can't tell you how happy I am to meet you, General. And I can't tell you how happy I am to meet you, Mr. Rainsford. 
But come, we shouldn't be chatting here. We can talk later. You must be hungry. Yes, I am, rather. Uh, 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 what? Uh, Ivan thought you'd like a robe. He's drying your clothes for you. Oh, thank you. Ivan's an incredibly strong fellow, but you mustn't mind his looks. His ears were cut off in battle, and he has the misfortune to be deaf and dumb. He is sensitive about his appearance. A simple fellow, really, but I'm afraid a bit savage. Oh? He's been in our family for years. <laughs> Follow Ivan, if you please, Mr. Rainsford. I was about to have my luncheon just before you awoke. You can have it together now. Does the robe fit you all right? Oh, yes, yes, perfectly, thanks. I am so glad. You uh, have quite a collection of heads here. Lions, tigers, mm. elephants, moose, bears... Oh, I don't believe I've ever seen a more perfect specimen. They are nice. I take great pride in them. You have good cause. Coming from you, Mr. Rainsford, that is a great compliment. And here we are. You sit over there. Thank you. Not at all. Right, Ivan. <laughs> we do our best to preserve the amenities of civilization here. Please forgive many lapses. Of course. Yes. Well off the beaten track, you know. Uh, Shushu. 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 <laughs> This is my little pet, Mr. Rainsford. As a hunting falcon, Shushu is of no further usefulness in the field. But I am fond of its company. Am I not, little sweetheart? <coughs> Patience, my darling. I know you're hungry, my dear. We hunt tonight. Your, uh, your heads are really remarkable, General. Mm. That, uh, that Cape Buffalo is the largest I've ever seen. Ah, it's that fellow. He's a monster. Mm. Did he charge you? Hurled me against a tree, fractured my skull, left me the scar. And I got the brute. <laughs> I've, uh, I've always thought the Cape Buffalo is the most dangerous of all games. Oh, uh, no, no, you're wrong. Wrong, sir. The Cape Buffalo is not the most dangerous game. Ivan, the wine. Uh, how does he understand you? He reads my lips. I think you like this champagne, Mr. Rainsford. Ivan chills it expertly. Uh, no, no, the, the cave of buffalo is not the most dangerous game. Here in my preserve on this island, I hunt more dangerous game. Oh, well, is there a big game on this island? The biggest. Oh, really? Oh, it isn't here naturally, of course. I have to stock the island. Uh, what have you imported, General? Uh, jaguars? Mm, jaguars. I hope you like filet mignon, Mr. Red. I do very much, thank you. Uh, is it jaguars, General? No, 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 no. Hunting jaguars ceased to interest me some years ago. I exhausted their possibilities, you see. I... No thrill left in jaguars, you understand? No real danger. I live for danger, Mr. Rainsford. <clears throat> we will have some capital hunting. You and I. I shall be most glad to have your company. Yes, but I'll okay. tell you, you'll be amused, I know. I think you may say in all modesty that I've done a rare thing. Yes, I've invented a new sensation. May I pour you another glass of champagne, Mr. Rainsford? Thank you, General. God makes some men poets. Some he makes kings, some beggars. Me, he made a hunter. My hand was made for the trigger. My father once said that. Made for the trigger. My whole life has been one prolonged hunt. I've hunted every kind of game in every land. It'd be impossible for me to tell you how many animals I've killed. Grizzlies in your Rockies, crocodiles in the Ganges, rhinoceroses in East Africa. This is in Africa, by the way. That Cape Buffalo hit me and made me up for six months. Mm. As soon as I recovered, I started for the Amazon to hunt jaguars, for I'd heard they were unusually cunning. <laughs> They weren't. They were no match at all for a hunter with his wits about him, the high-powered rifle. I was bitterly disappointed. I was lying in my tent with a splitting headache one night, and a terrible thought pushed its way into my head. Hunting was beginning to bore me, and hunting, remember, had been my life. I've heard that in America, businessmen often go to pieces when they give up the business that's been their life? Yes, yes, that's uh, so. I, I had no wish to go to pieces. <laughs> I, I, I must do something. Uh, now, mine is an analytical mind, Mr. Rainsford. Doubtless, that is why I enjoy the problems of the chase. Oh, no doubt, General. So I asked myself why the hunt no longer fascinated me. You are much younger than I am, Mr. Rainsford, and have not hunted as much, but you perhaps can guess the answer. Well, what is it? Simply this. 
Hunting had ceased to be what you call a sporting proposition. It had become too easy. I always got my quarry. Always. There's no greater bore than perfection. Cigarette? Well, no, thank you. Uh, no animal had a chance with me anymore. Not a chance. That is no boast. It is a mathematical certainty. The animal had nothing but his legs and his instinct. Instinct is no match for reason. When I thought of this, it was a tragic moment for me, I can tell you. It came to me as an inspiration. What I must do. And that was? I had to invent a new animal to hunt. A new animal? Oh, you're joking. Not at all. I never joke about hunting. I needed a new animal. I found one. So I bought this island, built this castle, and here I do my hunting. The island is perfect for my purposes. There are jungles with a maze of trails in them. Hills, swamps... Yes, but the terrain. animal... The animal, General Zara. It supplies me with the most exciting hunting in the world. No other hunting compares with it for an instant. Every day I hunt... I never grow bored now, for I have a quarry with which I can match my wits. Yes, but you still have I wanted the ideal animal to hunt, so I said, what are the attributes of an ideal quarry? And the answer was, of course, it must have courage, cunning, and above all, it must be able to reason. Well, no animal can reason. My dear fellow, there is one that can. One? But you can't mean... And why not? Well, I... I can't believe you're serious, General Zaroff. You're just joking. Joking? I'm quite serious. Speaking about hunting. Hunting? You're speaking about murder. Oh, dear me, that unpleasant word. I think I can show you that your scruples are quite ill-founded. Yes? I hunt the scum of the earth. Sailors from tramp ships, Laskars... Japs, mongrels, a thoroughbred horse, a hound is worth more than a score of them. But these are men. Precisely, that is why I use them. It gives me pleasure. They can reason after a fashion, so they are dangerous. But where do you get them? Oh, we visit my training school. It is in the cellar. I have about a dozen pupils down there now. They're from the Spanish park San Lucar that had the bad luck to go with the rocks out there. A very inferior lot, I regret to say. Poor specimens, more accustomed to the deck than to the jungle. Another glass? No. It's a game, you see. It's a sort of game. I, I suggest to one of them that we go hunting. I give him a supply of food and an excellent hunting knife. I give him three hours' start. I am to follow, armed only with a pistol of the smallest caliber and range. If my quarry eludes me for three whole days, he wins the game. If I find him, he loses. Suppose he refuses to be hunted. Oh, I give him his choice, of course. He need not play that game if he does not wish to. If he does not wish to hunt, I turn him over to Ivan. Mm, Ivan once had the honor of serving as official knouter to my old king, and he has his own ideas of sport. Invariably, Mr. Rainsford, invariably they choose the hunt. And if they win? Uh, to date, I have not lost. I do not wish you to think me a braggart, Mr. Rainsford, many of them afford only the most elementary sort of problem, I assure you. Occasionally, I strike a tartar. <laughs> she so remembers the tartar, don't you, Doctor? Yes. yes, he almost did win. I eventually had to use the hounds. You see? Wait a moment, I'll open the window. Hello, boys! <laughs> a rather good lot, I think. They're let out at seven every night. If anyone should try to get into my castle or out of it, something extremely regrettable would occur to you. Uh, but enough of this. Come, I want to show you a collection of heads I'm quite sure you've never seen before. Join me in the library for coffee. 
I uh, hope that you will excuse me tonight, General. Oh. I, I'm really not feeling well at all. Indeed. I know what it is. My old complaints. <laughs> On you, we boredom. You need some excitement. Tonight we'll hunt. Hey, Mr. Rainsford. You and I. You're wrong, General. I won't hunt. I won't murder. As you wish, my friend. The choice rests entirely with you. But may I not venture to suggest that you will find my idea of sport more diverting than Ivan's? You, my dear fellow. You don't mean that you plan to hunt me. My dear fellow. Have I not told you? I always mean what I say about hunting. This is really an inspiration. I drink to a foeman worthy of my steel at last. Excellent. I simply can't believe it. This must be some sort of dream. You'll find the game worth playing, Mr. Rainsford. Think of it, your brain against mine, your woodcraft against mine, your strength, your stamina against mine. Outdoor chess. <laughs> and the stake is not without value, eh? And if I win... I'll cheerfully acknowledge myself defeated if I do not find you by midnight of the third day. My sloop will place you on the mainland near a town. Or you can trust me. I give you my word as a gentleman and a sportsman. Of course, you in turn must agree to say nothing of your visit here. I will agree to nothing of the kind. Oh. Well, in that case... Hmm, but why discuss that now? Uh, three days hence, we can discuss it over a bottle of Veuve Clicquot, unless, uh... Well, your choice, Mr. Rainsford. I'm a hunter. You know my choice. Mm -hmm. Ivan here will supply you with hunting clothes, food, and knife. I suggest you wear moccasins. They leave a poorer trail. I suggest, too, that you avoid the big swamp in the southeast corner of the island. We call it Death Swamp. There's quicksand there. Well, I must beg you to excuse me now. We always take our siesta after our lunch. Don't we, Shushu? <laughs> yes. Come, my little pet. You'll hardly have time for a nap, I fear, Mr. Rainsford. Uh, you, you'll want to start, of course. I shall not follow till dusk. Hunting at night is so much more exciting than by day, don't you think? <clears throat> well, au revoir, Mr. Rainsford. Oh, I... <laughs> I'd fought my way through the bush for two hours, repeating to myself over and over again, I must keep my nerve, I must keep my nerve. My whole idea at first was to put distance between myself and General Zarov. And to this end, I had plunged along through the thicket spurred on by the sharp rowls of something very much like panic. Now I had got a grip on myself. I'd stopped. I was taking stock of the situation. I saw that straight flight was futile. Inevitably, it would bring me face to face with the sea. Well, I'll give him a trail, I muttered. And I struck off from the rude path I had been following and into the trackless wilderness. I made a series of intricate loops. I doubled back on my trail again and again, recalling all the lore of the fox hunt, all the dodges of the fox. Night found me exhausted, my hands and face lashed by the branches on a thickly wooded ridge. My need for rest was imperative, and I thought, I played the fox, now I must play the cat of the fable. A big tree with a thick trunk and outspread branches was nearby, and taking care not to leave the slightest mark, I climbed up and stretched out among the broad limbs. Rest brought me new confidence and almost a feeling of security. Even so expert a hunter as General Zaroff cannot face me here, I assured myself. An apprehensive night crawled slowly by, my mind keenly alert for any sound, any warning. And towards the dawn, an instinct I never knew existed, like an animal must possess, and held me to look far off in the distance from the westerly direction. Sure enough, following the trail with the sureness of a bloodhound came General Zaroff. Nothing escaped those searching black eyes, no cracked blade of grass, no bent twig, no mark, no matter how fine in the moss. My heart pounding furiously, I slid down quickly from the tree and struck off again into the woods. I knew I had to do something desperate. I knew that I had little time in which to do it. And 300 yards from my hiding place, I stopped where a huge dead tree leaned precariously on a smaller living one. Throwing off my sack of food, I took my knife from its sheath and began to work with all my energy. The job was finished at last. And I threw myself down behind a fallen log 300 feet away. 
I did not have to wait long. I too have hunted in Malacca. You are proving interesting, Mr. Rainsford. Mm. Very interesting. The tree brushed my shoulders. I jumped back. I'm going to have a wound rest. Only slight. So I shall be back, Mr. Rainsford. I shall be back. <laughs> It was flight now, a desperate, hopeless flight that carried me on for hours. I don't know where I got the strength. I kept telling myself over and over again that I must keep my nerve. That I was competing with a monster, a super huntsman. Dusk came, then darkness, and still I managed to press on. The ground grew softer under my moccasins. The vegetation grew ranker, denser. Insects bit at me savagely. Suddenly, as I stepped forward, my foot sank into the ooze. I tried to wrench it back, but the muck sucked viciously at my foot like a giant leech. With a violent effort, I tore my foot loose. I knew where I was then. Death swamp and its quicksand. But the softness of the earth had given me an idea. I stepped back from the quicksand a dozen feet or so and began to dig. When the pit was above my shoulders, I climbed out and from some hard saplings cut stakes and sharpened them to fine points. These stakes I planted in the bottom of the pit with the points sticking upwards. As fast as I could, I wove a rough carpet of weeds and branches and with it covered the mouth of the pit. And wet with sweat and aching with tiredness, I crouched behind the stump of a lightning charm tree. Oh, I knew Zaroff was coming. I could hear the paddling sound of his feet on the soft earth. Zaroff was coming and coming fast. He was not feeling his way along foot by foot. Crouching there, I couldn't either see him nor see the pit. I lived a year and a minute, frozen, every muscle tensed. young sapling and to it fastened my hunting knife with the blade pointing down the trail. With a bit of wild grapevine, I tied back the sapling. Then I ran for my life. I raised that next flying as I heard them and felt the fresh scent. I knew then how an animal at bay feels. At last I had to stop to get my breath. The baying of the hounds stopped just as suddenly. And with it, my heart stopped too. They must have reached the knife. 
Excitedly, I shinned up a tree and looked back. My pursuers had stopped all right, but the hope that had been in my brain when I climbed died. For in the shallow valley, I saw that General Zaroff was still on his feet, but Ivan was not. Apparently, he had come along to hold the hounds. The knife, driven by the recoil of the springing tree, had splintered through his chest. I'd hardly tumbled to the ground when the pack took up the cry again. Nerve, 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 I panted as I dashed along. A blue gap showed between the trees dead ahead. The hounds were almost on top of me. I forced myself on towards that gap. I reached it. It was the shore of the sea. Across the cove, I could see the gloomy gray stone of the castle. Twenty feet below me, the sea rumbled and hissed. I hesitated. I heard the hounds. Then I leaped far out into the sea. was good to me. And I'm here safe in the general's bedroom waiting for him. Three days are up and I've eluded him. But now I must go further. In a moment we will meet, he and I, and he will be unarmed. Only one of us is going to live. You understand that now. patient, dear. You must forgive me. You're hungry, I know. <laughs> Shushu. Rainsford. Jen. Rainsford. How on earth did you get it? I swam. I found it easier and quicker than walking through the jungle. I congratulate you. You've won the game. Oh, no, General. I'm still a beast at bay here. <coughs> Get ready, General Zaroff. Swords? Yes, two of them. I see. Oh, very good. Very good, Rainsford. One of us, then, is to furnish a repast for the hounds. The other will sleep in this, this very excellent bed. Huh. Excellent. On guard, Rainsford. My late host said it would be a very excellent bed. And so closes The Most Dangerous Game by Richard Connell, starring Orson Welles, tonight's tale of... Suspense. Mr. Wells was General Zaroff and Keenan Wynn Rainsford. This is your narrator, the man in black, who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense next week, same time, when Orson Wells will again be our star in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Lost Special. The producer of suspense is William Spear, who tonight also directed the broadcast. And who with Bernard Herman, the conductor, Lucian Marowick, who composed the original score, and Private Jack Anson Fink, the radio author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
Suspense. Tonight, Roma Wines bring you the distinguished actor, Mr. Ronald Coleman, in one of the great suspense stories of our time, August Heat. Suspense is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live, to your happiness and entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Before we bring you Ronald Coleman and our suspense play, here's a brief message from Elsa Maxwell, famed for her great charm as a hostess. When food looks appetizing, it almost always lives up to expectations. When even so simple a main dish as a steaming, fragrant bowl of spaghetti or beans is surrounded by bright green salads, golden rolls or muffins, and brilliant Roma California Burgundy, the food is more enjoyable, more delightful. And for a summery touch of the outdoors, a vase of flowers, perfect color complement to the deep, rich beauty of Roma Burgundy. You'll enjoy the fruity, robust taste, the tart piquancy of distinguished Roma Burgundy served cool. Truly a masterpiece of fine winemaking. Like all Roma wines, Roma Burgundy is unvaryingly good, always high in quality of bouquet, color, and taste. The happy reward of selected grapes, brought slowly to perfection, gently pressed, then carefully guided to flavorfulness by the ancient skill of Roma's noted wineries in California's choicest vineyards. Yet all this goodness is yours for only pennies a glass. Remember... More Americans enjoy Roma than any other wine. R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Yes, right now a glass full would be very pleasant, as Roma Wines bring you a remarkable tale of suspense. And with August Heat, W.F. Harvey's matchless narrative of premonition and the brooding terror of twilight and the unseen, and with the performance of Ronald Coleman... Roma Wines hope indeed to keep you in suspense. Peniston Road, Tampa. August the 20th, 1945. I have had what I believe to be the most remarkable day in my life. And while the events are still fresh in my mind, I wish to put them down on paper as clearly as possible. Let me say at the outset that my name is James Clarence Withencroft. You must remember that in order to have the full implication of my story. James Clarence Withencroft. I'm 40 years old, in perfect health, never having known a day's illness. By profession, I am an artist. Not a very successful one, but I earn enough money by my black and white work to satisfy my necessary wants. My only near relative, a sister, died five years ago, so that there is no one in particular to whom I address this manuscript, only you, who might by chance read it someday. For, because of the peculiar circumstance about which you will soon hear, I have the strong premonition that I shall never live to tell anyone about it. I breakfasted this morning at nine at the usual time. It was no different from any other morning. And after glancing through the morning paper, I lighted my pipe. And I proceeded to let my mind wander in the hope that I might chance upon some subject for my pencil. The room, though door and window were open, was oppressively hot. 
and I had just made up my mind that the coolest and most comfortable place in the neighborhood would be the deep end of the public swimming bath, when, when I was suddenly shaken. A feeling swept over me such as I'd never experienced before. I attempted to rise to my feet, but somehow it seemed as though I had suddenly been fastened to my chair. My hand went out in an effort to brace myself. And then, before I knew what I was doing, my pencil was in my hand, and I began to draw. It was as though someone had taken my hand and was moving it across the paper, swiftly, in bold strokes. And then I seemed to take over. My hand, under its own power, began to draw. I soon forgot the oppressive heat. Everything was forgotten in this frantic feeling that the sketch must be finished as soon as possible. I had no idea how long I worked until I heard the clock of St. Jude's in the distance. It was four o'clock, and I had started just after breakfast. Now, for the first time since I'd begun, I actually seemed to see what I had been sketching. I was surprised. The final result was I felt sure the best thing I'd ever done. It showed a criminal in the dock immediately after the judge had pronounced sentence. The man was fat, enormously fat. The flesh hung in rolls about his chin. It creased his huge, stumpy neck. He was clean-shaven, or perhaps I should say a few days before he must have been clean-shaven. And he was almost bald. He stood there before the judge, his short, clumsy fingers clasping the rail, looking straight in front of him. The feeling that his expression conveyed was not so much one of horror as of utter, absolute collapse. There seemed nothing in the man strong enough to sustain that mountain of flesh. And then, and then I saw that the sketch wasn't complete, for the man's other hand seemed to be clutching an instrument of some kind, a weapon, but, but it hadn't been completed. I had made this sketch, and yet I had no recollection of what I'd intended the man to carry in his other hand. I took up my pencil again, and I attempted to fill in the fuzzy outline, but, but it was useless. It was as though my fingers had suddenly turned to lead, I sat down, and I felt the moisture slowly forming on my forehead. And once again, I was conscious of the oppressive heat. Then I knew that there would be no finishing of the sketch, at any rate not for the moment. So I rolled it up, and without quite knowing why, I put it in my pocket. In spite of my peculiar inspiration, I was filled with a rare sense of happiness which the knowledge of a good thing well done gives. I believe that I set out with the idea of calling upon Trenton, for I remember walking along Lytton Street and turning to the right along Gilchrist Road, at the bottom of the hill where the men are at work on the new tram line. From there onwards, I have only the vaguest recollection of where I went, through parks, along crowded streets, always conscious of the awful heat that came up from the dusty asphalt pavement in a suffocating wave. hollow sound of my footsteps as I moved along. Although walking aimlessly, I somehow knew that there was a goal, a something to which I was drawn. I longed for the thunder promised by the great banks of copper-colored clouds that hung low over the western sky. I have really no idea how far I walked when a small boy roused me from my abstraction. You go for time, mister? Twenty minutes to seven. Thanks. Hot enough for you, sir? Yes. When he left me, I began to take stock of my bearings. I found myself standing before a gate that led into a yard bordered by a strip of thirsty earth. There were flowers, purple stock and scarlet geranium, and great numbers of bees droned over them. 
I stood looking down at them for a moment, and then, for some reason, I looked up. Over the entrance to the place, there was a board with the inscription, Charles Atkinson, Monumental Mason, worker in English and Italian marbles. From the yard itself came a cheery whistle, the noise of hammer blows and the cold sound of steel meeting stone. A sudden impulse made me enter, and I went in, in, in the direction of the noise. There was a man, sitting with his back towards me. He was busy at work on a slab of curiously painted marble. Then, without turning, his hammer stopped in mid-air, as he was about to bring it down on his chisel. He held his position a moment before turning, but I knew that he was aware of my presence, and when he turned, I saw his face. It was, although I'd never seen him before, it was the face of the man I had been drawing. Yes, it was the face of the man whose sketch was in my pocket. He sat there on his low stool, huge and elephantine, the sweat pouring from his scalp, not speaking. Then he took a red silk handkerchief and he mopped his brow. Although this face that looked up at me was the same as my sketch, the expression was absolutely different. Suddenly the puzzled expression left his face and he smiled, as if we were old friends. And he walked over and he took my hand. Good day, sir. Good day. I'm sorry to intrude. Not at all. Everything is so hot and glary outside. This, this is like an oasis in the wilderness. <laughs> I don't know about an oasis, but it certainly is hot. Whew. Take a seat, sir. He pointed to the end of the gravestone on which he was at work, and I sat down. Whew. Very hot. That's a beautiful piece of stone you've got hold of. In a way, it is. The surface here is as fine as anything you could wish. But there's a big floor at the back. Oh, I don't expect you'd notice it. Oh, I shouldn't think so. I could never really do a good job on a bit of marble like that. It would uh, be all right in the summer like this. It wouldn't mind the blasted heat. But wait until the winter comes. Winter? Uh, there's nothing quite like frost to find out the weak points in stone. Oh. Uh, a gravestone, you see. Oh, I see. Mm. Then what's this one for? <laughs> You'd hardly believe if I was to tell you, but it's for exhibition. It's the truth. Artists have exhibitions, so do grocers and butchers. Oh, we have them too. All the latest little things in headstones, you know. He went on to talk of marbles, which sort of marble best withstood wind and rain, and which were easiest to work. Then of his garden and some new sort of carnation he had bought. At the end of every other minute, he would drop his tools, wipe his shining head, this heat, this heat's bad. A man's not responsible for what he does, this heat. I said little, for I felt uneasy. There was something unnatural, uncanny in all of this, the feeling that I'd experienced it all before. The oppressive heat, the fragrance of the stucks in the air, the conversation about the marble, the flowers, everything as though I, I had experienced it before. And yet I knew that I'd never, ever been in this section of town before. I tried to persuade myself that at least I'd seen him before. That his face, unknown to me, had found a place in some out-of-the-way corner of my memory. But I knew that I was practicing little more than a plausible piece of self-deception. As I sat there quietly, watching him, he looked up at me and he said, <sighs> There. What do you think of that? He said it with an air of evident pride, of a job well done. I could sense that he was experiencing the same feeling I had experienced when I'd finished my sketch. Then he got up with a sigh of relief. <clears throat> hot. Hot, ain't it? I was seated in such a position that I was unable to see his work. And for some reason, I didn't move. Suddenly... He began to read what he'd carved on the tombstone. 
He spoke deliberately and with a flat voice. In the midst of life, we are in death. On January 18, 1905. I looked up at the start. This man had read my exact birth date. He passed away very suddenly on August 20th, 1945. That's today. We usually use the present date on these exhibition stones. Do you... Do you usually put a name on them too? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, sacred to the memory of... James Clarence Withencroft. Cold shudders swept over me, and I sat there in silence. The sound of birds and crickets seemed loud in my ears as we stood there looking at each other, saying nothing. And then he mopped his brow again. Hot. Hot. I was finally able to speak. Where, where did you see that name? Hmm? Oh, I didn't see it anywhere. I wanted some name and I put down the first that came into my head. A strange coincidence, but it happens to be mine. Huh? That's... Your name? You're uh, James uh, Clarence... Uh... Withencroft, yes. Well... And uh, the dates? I can only answer for the birth date. It's correct. Oh. That's a rum go. I made a sketch this morning of you. Of me? But you've never seen me before. No. Oh. Oh. I took my sketch from my pocket and I showed it to him. As he looked, the expression on his face altered until it became more and more like that of the man I had drawn. And it was only the other day before that I told Mariah there were no such things as ghosts. Neither of us had seen a ghost, but I knew what he meant. Then I spoke to him. You... Oh, you probably heard my name someplace. Yes. Yeah, you must have seen me somewhere and have forgotten it. Yes, yes. Uh, were you at uh, uh, Clacton-on-Sea um, last uh, July? No. No, I've never been to Clacton in my life. Oh. And we were silent for some time again. And we stood there looking at one another and at the two dates on the gravestone. And the birth one was right and the other was today. Well, come inside and have some supper. <laughs> His wife was a strange little woman who was pallid with the look of those who live their lives indoors. Her husband introduced me as a friend of his who was an artist, and he informed her that I was staying to supper. I spoke, making some comment that I hoped I wouldn't be an intrusion, and she looked up at me and she said, You have a pleasing voice, Mr. Withencroft, and you're welcome in my home. I'm sorry Charles has not brought you here before. Very little was said during the meal, and after the sardines and watercress had been removed, she walked over to a cupboard, and she took down a thin black book, and as she handed it to me, she spoke. Would you read aloud, Mr. Withencroft? Puzzled, I 
I looked down at the book which she'd opened and placed before me. It was a very tiny book. The Prophet, it was called, by an author unknown to me with a strange Eastern name, Khalil Gibran. And my eyes fell across the page, and suddenly I was reading aloud, as she'd asked me to. Then Almitra spoke, saying, We would ask now of death. And he said, You would know the secret of death. But how shall you find it unless you seek it in the heart of life? The owl, whose night-bound eyes are blind unto the day, cannot unveil the mystery of light. If you would indeed behold the spirit of death, open your heart wide unto the body of life. For life and death are one, even as the river and the sea are one. In the depth of your hopes and desires, lies your silent knowledge of the beyond. And like seeds dreaming beneath the snow, your heart dreams of spring. Trust the dreams, for in them is hidden the gate to eternity. Your fear of death is but the trembling of the shepherd when he stands before the king whose hand is to be laid upon him in honor. Is the shepherd not joyful beneath his trembling? that he shall wear the mark of the king? Yet is he not more mindful of his trembling? For what is it to die but to stand naked in the wind and to melt into the sun? And what is it to cease breathing but to free the breath from its restless tides, that it may rise and expand and seek God unencumbered? Only when you drink from the river of silence shall you indeed sing and when you have reached the mountain top, then you shall begin to climb. And when the earth shall claim your limbs, then shall you truly dance. When I looked up, Mr. Atkinson had gone. But his wife stood before me, and as she took the book, she spoke. Thank you. Then I went outside. And I found Atkinson sitting on the gravestone and smoking. He looked up at me. Hot. Hot. Man's not responsible for what he might do in this heat. Mm -hmm. She never asked anyone to read aloud before. And then we talked about the sketch again. He looked at it. Likeness is me, all right. On trial. Uh, you, you must excuse my asking, but... Uh, do you know of anything you've done for which you could be put on trial? No, I've done nothing. <laughs> Not yet. He got up, fetched a can from the porch. And he began to water the flowers. Twice a day regular in the hot weather. And then the heat sometimes gets the better of the delicate ones. And ferns. Good Lord, they could never stand it. Where do you live? I told him my address. It would take an hour's quick walk to get back home. And he stopped watering. And he faced me squarely. It's like this. We look at the matter straight. If you both go back home tonight, you take your chance of accidents. A cart may run over you. There's always banana skins and orange peels. To say nothing of falling ladders. He spoke of the improbable with an intense seriousness that would have been laughable six hours before. But I did not laugh. The best thing we can do is for you to stay here till 12 o'clock. Then it'll be tomorrow, do you see? Yes. We'll go upstairs and smoke. Maybe cooler inside. And to my surprise, I agreed. We are sitting in a long, low room beneath the eaves. Atkinson has sent his wife to bed. He himself is, is busy sharpening some tools at a little oilstone. 
smoking one of my cigars the while. And as I look at my sketch before me, I suddenly see the fuzzy outline of what the man in the picture holds in his hands. But while I had not been able to sketch it before, I am able to do so now. It is a chisel, and it is stained with dark liquid. Ah, the sketch is completed now. The air seems charged with thunder, and I hear it in the distance. It is ominous, but but it carries the hope of rain. And perhaps this damnable heat will, will be broken soon, and the day will soon be over. It is close to 12. I am writing this at a, at a shaky table before the open window. The leg is cracked. And Atkinson, who, who seems a handy man with his tools, is going to mend it as soon as he has finished putting an edge on his chisel. There. It is twelve. The day is over. And I shall be going home. But the heat, the heat is stifling. This heat is enough to send a man mad. So closes August Heat, in which Roma Wines have brought you Ronald Coleman as star of tonight's study in Suspense. Suspense is produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Music for August Heat was composed by Lucian Morrowick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. Dennis Hoy appeared as Atkinson. This is Truman Bradley with a word for Roma Wines, the sponsor of Suspense. America's famed authority on hospitality, Elsa Maxwell recently made this suggestion for gracious entertainment. Your friends will respect your good taste when you serve delightful Roma California toque, enjoyable at any time, with coffee or dessert, with nuts and fruit. I suggest serving Roma toque cool. A most timely suggestion for Miss Maxwell. You'll find flame bright Roma toque velvety smooth, moderately sweet, light, yet delightfully rich in color. And you'll find Roma wines always delicious, of unvarying fine quality and goodness. June is the month of weddings, and the most distinguished way to paint the June bride is by serving Roma California Champagne. Its gold and sparkle and delicious, delightful dryness tell you that here is a truly fine champagne, Roma Champagne. Next time you plan for a special occasion, add this sparkling touch of perfection, good Roma Champagne. Next Thursday, you will hear John Payne and Frank McHugh as stars of Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.